just be glad Pastor Jimmy's not here because you know how he can be. I mean, it's like, uh, I, what's up, Redeemer? Good to see everybody today. Again, I can't see you, but at least we can be together and talk about God's Word. Now, um, our Wednesday night service is something that is new that we're experimenting with, and we're always glad to offer teaching. And that's really the point of this. Um, we can't be together as we normally are, and though we are meeting together in our small groups via Zoom, discipleship groups via Zoom, and we have our Sunday morning messages and some of the liturgy online uh, for the weekend, but we want to do as much encouragement as we can and strengthen one another with God's Word. Now, if you're new here or haven't done so yet, we would love for you to hit the subscribe button on YouTube. That way you get all of the updates uh, when we release new content. And also for tonight, as we do every Wednesday, if you have any questions, um, as they pop into your head, be sure and type them up in the chat box if you're on our YouTube channel. And um, I'm going to try to work through those at the end of our time together. That we can't be together um, like we normally are supposed to be, and like we genuinely want to, it does create a greater burden on us, but a burden for each other. In fact, I wanted to, before we even get into what we're going to talk about tonight, I wanted to share a passage of scripture that um, my discipleship group was reading this morning, and that's in Colossians chapter 2. And I found it to be very relevant to the situation that we find ourselves in, longing to encourage each other, but not being able to see each other in the way that we're accustomed to. In Colossians 2, the Apostle Paul says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments, for though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Even though we can't be together, we can walk with one another in Jesus. We can be there in spirit with the aim of encouraging one another, one another spiritually. So, um, stay in the Word, stay in prayer, but stay connected to each other through various means of communication, email, text, phone calls, socially appropriately, socially distanced interactions, whatever, um, and jump in a small group. We call them community groups or a discipleship group. And if you're not plugged into one, just contact the church office and uh, we'll get you set up as soon as possible. Because what we really need now, more than ever, is an ordered and firm faith in Jesus Christ. Tonight, we're going to talk about prayer, and specifically, something that tends to be missing from our prayer lives. We know what prayer is, most of us, right? We have a good grasp of it. We know what we do when we pray to certain degrees, but I tend to find in my life and in the lives of the Christians that I know that there are certain things that are, tend to be missing or at least misunderstood. So I want us to start at the beginning here as we consider prayer. Before I get to what we're lacking in our prayer lives, I want us to just get a refresh on the basics of prayer. Now, what is prayer? Now, we could say it's a conversation with the Lord, people would say, or it's talking to the Lord. But I want us to consider prayer as a gift. Prayer is a gift that God gives His people. Now, a good definition of prayer, there are many. John Bunyan's work on prayer, which you can get as a Puritan paperback, you can read it online, is a classic work, one of my favorite works on prayer. Um, great definition there. But what I want to use tonight is a prayer from the Baptist Catechism. Baptists stole it from the Presbyterians. It's also in the Westminster Catechism. Uh, here is the answer. What is prayer? Prayer is an offering up of our desires to God by the assistance of the Holy Spirit for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ, believing with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. That's what prayer is. It is an offering up of our hearts to God in the name of Christ, through faith in Christ, in dependence upon him, believing, confessing our sins, it is utter dependency on the Lord. 
And God hears us. This is amazing grace that God listens. He is inclined to us as our Heavenly Father. You see, God doesn't hear your prayers because your prayers are perfectly um, orchestrated. God doesn't hear your prayers because your prayers are good. God hears your prayers because you have been reconciled to the Father through the life, death, and resurrection of the Son. You see, your prayers are acceptable to God because you are acceptable to God in Jesus Christ. And that's something that we have to lock down. God doesn't uh, dismiss your prayer because there's a mixture of sin in it. He accepts you, therefore he hears your cries. So why exactly does God want us to pray? Like, What is the purpose of prayer? Um, we know that we are commanded, clearly we're commanded to pray, to pray without ceasing, as it says in Thessalonians. But why are we called to pray? I'll give you six basic reasons that God calls us to prayer. One, prayer is the primary way that we seek God. Right? How do we actively seek the Lord? We talk a lot about that. We're going to seek the Lord. Um, we seek the Lord in prayer. That's the primary way we do it. Now, people would say, well, what about Scripture? Don't you seek the Lord in the Word? Yes, but prayerfully. Prayer is always a part of seeking God, where we are offering up our hearts to God, our desires to God, our needs to the Lord. So prayer is this primary way that we do that, where we are seeking His sovereign power to enlighten our minds or to change our hearts as we read and seek to better understand his word. Two, prayer is an essential element in worship. If you are going to adore the Lord or confess your sins, we're going to talk about that in just a minute, then um, prayer is the, the primary means by which we articulate that, right? We're not just admitting that we are sinners in general. We are confessing to our God that we have sinned against him first and foremost, as well as against those people that are made in his image. Three, we pray because prayer is the expression of our dependence upon God. That's how it is made known. That's how it comes out with a plea for mercy or for help. Four, prayer is a means that God chooses to use to accomplish his will. God can do anything. He doesn't need you or me to accomplish his plans, but he graciously chooses to use us and our prayers to accomplish his plan. He uses means like prayer as a part of, of pulling off his magnificent works and his acts of kindness and, and greatness. Number five, prayer is a way that we participate with God in his great work. So this is now from our side. Like, you want to be involved in the work of God? you want to take part in a work that you could never accomplish, then you pray in partnership with the Lord and he graciously uses your articulated desire to bring about great things. Prayer does change things and God allows us to be a part of that. And six, prayer is a fire that warms our hearts. If we're spiritually cold, if we're growing complacent or spiritually stagnant, how do we recover zeal, right? How can we get back to that place where we feel like we were on fire? Well, prayer is the primary means. Never divorced from Scripture, but prayer is what we use to, to fan those flames of zeal once again. Uh, Thomas Watson said this about prayer. He said, prayer is a preaching to ourselves in God's hearing. We speak to God to warm ourselves, it's not for his information, but for our edification. And that's how we ought to think about prayer and why we pray, to offer up ourselves to God for all of these reasons. Now, we struggle with prayer. I struggle with prayer. I don't know a Christian who doesn't struggle with some aspect of offering ourselves up to the Lord and giving him our desires and making known our needs. And we struggle with prayer for different reasons, right? I mean, sin has created distance between God and us, right? There was fall. There was separation, right? The communion that Adam and Eve had with God before they sinned was interrupted. There is sin between us. So it's, there's some static there. It's Jesus who reunites humanity to, humanity to God. It is Christ um, and walking in him that now leads us to lean into prayer, but we still struggle because prayer for many of us is new, right? When you become a Christian, it might be a totally new concept. Um, we need 
to pray, but we struggle with it because it's, it's essentially a one-way conversation, right? We, we talk to God when we pray. And God talks to us as we read his word. So sometimes it's getting used to that dimension. But we also struggle with it because prayer is a learned discipline. You you think it would come natural, right? Because God made us and we're made in his image and then we're saved by faith in Jesus. And now we've got a new heart that beats with love for God. But it has to be learned. The disciples in Luke 11 ask Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. Why would they ask? Because they, they didn't know. They didn't know how to do it. There are models of prayer all over the the world for them to look at, right? They had the Pharisees. They had mom and dad. They had all of these different examples. Then they were confused and weren't sure. So they said, Jesus, would you teach us how to pray? And Jesus had to teach his disciples how to pray in a very practical sense. And that's really how we learn. As you look at scripture, we really learn from modeled prayers um, and model prayers, and those are two different things, All right? So let's say like a model prayer would be like the Lord's Prayer. Like Jesus, when asked in Luke 11, hey, uh, how should we pray? Not only does he teach them, but he gives them a model prayer. He says, pray like this. And we, we, you have the Lord's Prayer, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's a model prayer, which is good. That can be prayed verbatim, which is good because it is a model. But we also learn from that model. It serves as a sort of template or an outline or an example by which uh, our prayer life is informed. So we have those model prayers in Scripture, um, but we also have resources like the Valley of Vision. The Valley of Vision is a collection of what are called Puritan prayers. It's a great resource. I highly recommend it. And I'll be recommending a bunch of books at the end of our time together uh, that relate to prayer that I would encourage you to read. So there are model prayers, and then there are modeled prayers. And what I mean by that is that... um, It's not a prayer given for us explicitly as an example to follow, but implicitly as other people are praying. So you can think of John 17 or many of the Psalms, right? In John 17, Jesus is praying to the Father. He's not saying, hey, watch watch this, I want you to pray like this. He's just talking to the Father, he's praying. Or when you read the Psalms, many of these are prayers to the Lord, and as these people are praying, these they become a, a model that informs us implicitly, not explicitly. And of course, we learn how to pray through the instruction that we find in parables and various exhortations from Jesus or from the apostles. Scripture is constantly forming our understanding and our habit of prayer. And prayer, for it to be effective, for it to be meaningful, for it to really come alive, must be theology-driven. In other words, if you're not a theologian, you can't pray. Now, what I'm not saying is, is if you're not a theologian like Michael Horton or R.C. Sproul, you can't pray. The real point is, is we're all theologians, and our theology will drive, form, and develop our prayer life. But if you are negligent in growing theologically, your prayer life will suffer. And if you are attempting to pray without any regard to doctrine, your prayer life is going to slow. It'll, it'll weak, weaken and wither. I'll, I'll give you an example. Most of you, I think, are familiar with what's called the ACTS model of prayer, A-C-T-S, right? So it's an acrostic. Every letter stands for a word. And this is a great way to teach yourself how to pray in a bit longer format than really offering up some petitions or requests to God. So let me just run through it very briefly for you and and explain how theology really uh, not just helps us to pray, but establishes what our prayers are really made of. So in the Acts model, it begins with A, adoration. Now, adoration is simply to marvel at God's beauty, the beauty of his character and his works, right? It is to stand back in awe and to essentially praise him for who he is and all that he does. That means the more that we know of God, the better equipped we are to praise him for who he is. So if you don't know that God is omniscient and omnipotent. If you don't understand that God is, uh, is, is a triune God, eternally existing in three persons, but is one God, one essence. The more you know about God, the more you are equipped to, to adore him 
for who he is. The more you understand his works, like his work of providence, his work of sovereignty, his work of regeneration in the heart of a person, the more equipped you are to adore him. So theology establishes adoration, but theology also establishes confession, right? C, A-C-T-S. Now, the more we know of God and who he is, his holiness, his righteousness, his justice, his goodness, the more we become aware of who we are. Right? The knowledge of God and the knowledge of self are connected in that we are made in God's image, but we are very different from him. And many of the ways in which we are different from him are a result of our sin. So to adore God is to marvel at his character and, and his work and to express amazement with our own words. So the more we know God and the, the more that we see his goodness the more confronted we are with our own corruption and heinousness. Good theological meditation of both the glory of God and the heinousness of our sin assists us in confessing and mortifying and repenting of our sins. Then there's thanksgiving, A-C-T. Now, thanksgiving is different from praise. A lot of people approach it as if, well, Adoration and thanksgiving or praise and thanksgiving are essentially the same thing, but they are different. And I'm willing to say that for most of us, our thanksgiving is small. Maybe we thank God for a few things. Maybe we pray. We had some chicken wings earlier tonight, and we thanked God for that, right? It's an easy thing to do, especially when you're having chicken wings, even if you have to. We can't get the hot stuff because we're babies. But the point is, is we thank God for something like that. But our thanksgiving will be as weak as our theology. You see, we have to have a better understanding of who God is in his care for us and his, in his provision for us. We need to be thankful to God for every good thing that happens in our lives and thankful for God's presence in every difficult or painful thing in our lives. Your expression of gratitude is magnified with your, a better theological grasp of how God operates in your life. So thanksgiving without theology doesn't exist. And the S stands for supplication in the Acts model. Supplication is pleading with God for specific things, specific needs, both for ourselves and for other people, right? So supplication is what most people tend to think about when they think about prayer. It's what I'm asking God to give me or what I'm asking God to do. And good theology. Good theology teaches us to what we must appeal in God when making our requests. Hear that. Good theology teaches us what we are supposed to appeal to in God when making our requests, and that is what I want us to focus on tonight. That is the, the missing aspect or the misunderstood aspect of much of our prayer life. So here's the summary for us, okay? The summary of what I want us to grasp is that our prayers are strengthened by reasoning with God through specific appeals to His glory and our need. I'll say it again. Our prayers are strengthened by reasoning with God through specific appeals to His glory and our need. Now, this for me was a big wake-up call in my own spiritual journey, my Christian life. Um, I was converted in 1990. Uh, by 1997, I was in my first year of seminary, newly married to the wonderful Jen Thorne, uh, pre-kids, right? And um, I was praying, uh, as I normally did, for the many of the common or repeated requests that I had. And I finally read this book by Thomas Watson and Samuel Lee called The Bible and the Closet. Now, these were two ministers that were ejected from ministry in 1662 in England because they ain't playing uh, with, uh, with the craziness going on over there uh, between the, the Church of England and Roman Catholicism and all of that. And so they kept breaking the rules and they were ultimately ejected. And they have these two works, the Bible about how to read the Bible and the closet, meaning the prayer closet, how to pray. In fact, um, the treatise that Samuel Lee wrote on prayer in that book is called Secret Prayer Successfully Managed. I was reading that book on prayer, that section in that book on prayer, and it was like it was like the lights began to turn on in an aspect of my prayer life that I had not yet understood. It wasn't the light switch getting turned on. It was like 
the Holy Spirit was turning up the dimmer switch on the lights. And the more I read and the more I thought through this and the more I prayed through it, the more I understood what was missing. What was missing in my prayer life and what I think is missing in many of our prayer lives is arguing with God. Now, that sounds weird. That sounds weird because arguing is either annoying or fun. It depends on if you're good at it or not. I think arguing is fun. It's one of the few things I can actually do well. But it's not that kind of arguing. It's not, it's not picking a fight with somebody. It, it, it's not a disagreement. By arguing, Lee meant reasoning, giving an argument for something, right? not against something. It was, it was an appeal to God based on something in God for God to respond positively to the request that is made by the one offering the prayer reasoning, or simply put, giving reasons. So that's what's missing in a lot of our prayer lives, reasoning with God. Lee says that real prayer will have an arguing and pleading spirit. Real prayer will have an arguing and pleading spirit. Like, I would, I would pray plain requests, right? My, so my, my prayer life was oftentimes plain requests. Um, I would, questions like, um, Lord, Help me to overcome this particular sin in my life. Time to move on to the next thing. Lord, I pray that you would save my mom and my dad. Because what else am I supposed to do but articulate the need, the desire? And it was moving from the plain request to the pleading request that began to unpack a lot more of what God calls us to in the life of prayer. Lee goes on to say that this pleading request, that's what I'm calling it, or or arguing with God, This is properly wrestling with God, humble yet earnest expostulations about his mind toward us. So it's it's not just arguing with God to do what we want because we want it. It's pleading with God to do a good thing for his glory. And we plead with him to do it because, as best as we can understand, it is in perfect conformity with his character, his work, and his history. An arguing frame, Lee goes on to say, an arguing frame in prayer cures and appeases the frights of spirit and then inquires of God. The temple of prayer is called the soul's inquiring place. And Lee goes on to talk about people like Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, David, Daniel as men who didn't just pray and throw up a plain request, but they would throw up a a request with pleading, reasoning, or argument. And so he gives, us, he gives us some examples of this in Scripture, right? That when you reason with God, what we're doing is we're asking God to act on our behalf or on the behalf of another because of a truth that we know God delights in or because, in a, because of an aspect of who he is that glorifies him. So here are some examples. Biblical writers oftentimes reasoned with God in prayer and their appeal to God was based on one— the multitude of God's mercies. In other words, they would ask God to answer their prayers because God is merciful. Here's an example. Psalm chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Now listen. Turn, O Lord, deliver my life, save me, For the sake of your steadfast love. What's he appealing to? Not just that he needs it. Yes, he needs it. He's talking all about that, about his need and about his trouble, about his affliction. But his appeal really is, Lord, save me because you are a God of love and you love me. And I know that you love me. You rejoice over me, not because I'm so good, but because you are so merciful. It's an appeal to God to answer based on who God is. Second, we will reason with God to hear and answer our prayers from the experience of former answers. This is Lee's words, right? In other words, we have a history with God and God has answered us and and been kind to us throughout our lives and we can appeal to that as, a, as another reason why God should hear our prayers. For example, Psalm chapter 4, verse 1. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. In other words, God, you've done it before. 
I know that you are good and kind, and I'm not asking you to do something that you haven't done before, so will you do that again? Will you help me now in my hour of need just like you have in the past? Third, biblical writers will appeal to God, reason with God, to hear them and to answer their prayers from their trust and their reliance upon Him. Listen to Psalm 16, verses 1 and 2. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. What's, what's he pleading? Lord, um, protect me, preserve me, because I believe. I trust you. I, tr- I mean, I am going to you for help and for defense. And so, will you defend me as my shelter? You've promised to be that. Many of our pleadings with God are based not just upon his character, but upon his promises. Fourth, we can appeal to God to help us, as many of the biblical writers do, by basing um, our request on the equity of God, as Lee says, or his justice. So Psalm 17, verse 1, Hear a just cause, O Lord, and attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips that are free of deceit. In other words, God, I, I, I pray that you would meet me in this particular need, whatever that is, because it is just. I'm not asking you to cheat. I'm not asking for favoritism here. That's going, that, that I'm, not, I'm not asking you for something that I deserve from you, but I, I am asking, God, that you would help me in this just cause because I need vindication. I'm not lying. I'm not lying to them. I'm not lying to you. So, God, will, will you do your work of justice for this just cause? And finally, we can appeal to God in our prayers to, to hear us and to answer from the shame and confusion that God will put his people to if not answered and that others might even be driven away from God. Or, to say it differently, we can appeal to God to answer us in our hour of need so that people are not confused as if God doesn't hear. Psalm 31, verse 17 O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them go silently to Sheol or to the grave. Lord, they all know that I'm counting on you, that I'm calling on you to save me, to rescue me, to provide for me. So Lord, I don't want them to think that you aren't there. I want them to know and to see that you are there and that you take care of your people. All of these are just a few examples of reasoned prayer in Scripture, these are appeals made to God to hear and to answer our prayer based on his own work, his own character, and his own glory. Lee says, We find these and many similar pleadings in Scripture as patterns in prayer, being suggested by the Spirit, kindled from the altar, and perfumed with Christ's incense. They rise up like memorial pillars before the oracle. So let me give you one big biblical example of this, and then I want us to talk about what this looks like in a practical sense, just to give you some, some, some small examples to sort of push you into this a little bit deeper. So consider Genesis 18, verses 22 through 33. Judgment is about to fall on Sodom. And um, Abraham is concerned because his man Lot is in there, and he doesn't want Lot to be consumed with the fires of God's judgment against an ungodly city. Genesis 18, 22. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood before the Lord. And when Abraham drew near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? That's the key verse to keep in mind. This is the basis of his pleading with God. Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away that place and not spare it if the 50 who are in it are righteous? Far be it from me to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, he's pushing. right? Abraham is pushing. He's pleading. Abraham knows they ain't 50 righteous people in Sodom. 
Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, uh, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. Not 50, not 45, just 40. And the Lord said, for the sake of the 40, I will not do it. Then Abraham said, oh, let the Lord not be angry and I will speak. Suppose there are 30 found there. And he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And Abraham said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. And God said, For the sake of the 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Let the Lord not be angry. We'll speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, For the sake of the 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. What is Abraham doing? He is pleading with God. He is reasoning with God. He's not bartering with God. He's not, you give me this, I'll give you that. Lord, if you get me out of this mess, I promise I'll never miss a day of church again. It's not a bartering. It's a pleading. But it's a pleading with God based on who God is. God, you are righteous and just. You do not punish the righteous for the deeds of the wicked. So while Abraham is really concerned about Lot, um, he's making the argument, God, you will not destroy the righteous, with your anger against unrighteousness, will you? And God said, no. His pleading was based on the righteousness of God. So let me, let's get a little bit more practical here and talk about this for our own lives. What does this look like for us when we're praying? So let's just walk through very briefly just five examples where this might come into play praying for salvation, praying for healing, praying for vindication when you've been wronged and publicly humiliated, praying for provision, and praying for perseverance, okay? So, you're praying for salvation, for someone to be converted. Like I said, before I read this book um, by Samuel Lee, I would pray for people to be saved, and I had a long list of people, and I would just pray for them name by name, but literally, each prayer for each person took a second. Lord, save my mom and my dad. That would be the prayer. I just wasn't sure what else to say. Pretty please, 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 please. But then I began to reason. So when we're asking God to pray, and when we're praying to God and asking God to save someone, we give him reasons. That's what we're talking about. You give God reasons to do the thing you're asking for. Reasons like, Lord, if you will save my mom and my dad, It will be a demonstration of your love and mercy that not only they will know and experience, but others around them will see as well. There's a reason. There's a pleading that is couched in who God is and what he does. I mean, I would pray for my dad. Both of my mom and dad are converted now. My mom has passed away, so she's in heaven, kicking it with the Lord. My dad is still with us and running strong. Um, But at the time I was praying and I would say, God, would you save my dad because he can't rescue himself from his sins? He is under your curse and that's fair and just, but he needs your power to deliver him from his slave master. Or if you're praying for somebody uh, to be saved, in my case, my parents, um, I remember asking the Lord, I began to give them reasons and and one of the reasons was, Lord, um, I, I pray that you would save my mom and dad because I need Christian parents. Like I, I need that as a part of my life to, to have this joy in my family, to, to have this, this spiritual strength in my family that we've never had before. Maybe it's God save this person because I need them and everyone around them to see that you are real through a life that has changed. Give reasons for God to answer your prayer. What about for healing? Right? It could be as simple as uh, heal my, my, my friend or myself of this sickness, um, of this disease, of this temporal infirmity or whatever. And maybe it is, maybe, maybe the pleading is, Lord, um, this could be a, a shadow that is seen of, of what is to come when the resurrection is now our reality. Let people see that you are a God that heals and will in the end ultimately remove all death and disease. 
Um, Lord, uh, heal my friend or my family members so that you will be praised for your mercy and your compassion. Or maybe you're praying for vindication. You've been wronged. People are coming at you. You haven't done anything wrong to them, but you are a true victim. And David found himself like this quite a bit. And he would, he would pray, God, vindicate me. I'm righteous in this situation. I'm not sinless. He's just saying, I'm right. in this situation, I've done the right thing, but I'm getting slammed because of it. So God, vindicate me, establish me, deliver me from my enemies. And perhaps, and like David, part of the reason is, Lord, because if you do this, then you show that you support your people. Like, you, you will demonstrate that you do not leave us then that when they hear us praying and invoking your name, they will see that you stand with your, your children. Or maybe, maybe a more common thing would be a prayer for provision. And you're, you're asking God to meet needs, right? like right now. A lot of people are in desperate need. I know a lot of you are really struggling and hurting because of the pandemic and the restriction from, from work. And you're asking God to provide, to help to comfort us. Why? Why should God do that? Well, again, you can appeal to his mercy. You can appeal to his compassion. You can appeal to his generosity. In fact, when you're praying, God, would you help us to meet this need, not just so that we will have help and comfort, but so that we can then turn around and help and comfort others with the comfort that we've received from you, both spiritually and materially. There's a reason. When God answers the prayer of provision, it's an occasion for us to recognize and to triumph that he, that he is the giver of all good things. But at the same time, we need to pray for strength, for change, for perseverance. And this is particularly important because God does not always provide the things that we desire, even the things that we need. Sometimes the provision that God gives us is not the material need, but the strength to endure without that material need. So when we ask God, God, would you um, give me strength to endure this time? Will you change my heart and my life where I'm struggling with this particular sin? It is, it is a, an appeal to God's promise of perseverance. Right? Lord, you have said that uh, the good work that has been begun in me will be carried to the day of completion. Like you're going to keep working in me. So Lord, I'm appealing to that. Lord, change me because you said that you would continue to work in me and that you wouldn't stop. So this is a basic appeal. But also, perhaps you could argue with God, Lord, give me strength to persevere so that when I truly have nothing, I can see and testify that I still have you, which means I still have enough. That in fact, when I have nothing in this world, I still have everything in heaven and I have everything in Christ. All of this means, in short, um, when you pray, make your case. Argue your case. No, you're not a lawyer. You're not trying to get God on a technicality, but you're reasoning with God to hear your prayer and to answer you positively because you were seeking to pray in accordance with his character, his work, and his will. Argue it. Appeal to God's glory and to your own need. These are legitimate ways of doing it. I'll close with what Lee said here. Oh, it is a blessed thing to aspire to this heavenly philosophy of prayer, to argue blessings out of the hand of God. Here is a spacious field. I have given but a small prospect where the soul, like Jacob, enters the inclination with omnipotency and by holy force obtains the blessing. There are a few really good books on prayer. Well, let me put it this way. There are thousands of books on prayer. Most of them are terrible. Okay, most of them, don't buy books on prayer unless you dig a little deep into it and find out who's right and what and who's saying what. Terrible, worst books in the world. Some of the worst books. Uh, so you don't, just be careful. So I'm going to give you some recommendations that are legit, awesome. I love them. These have been really formative for me personally. All of them are old except for two. So I've already mentioned one, John Bunyan's Treatise on Prayer. You can get that as a Puritan paperback, or you can find it online, John Bunyan on Prayer. I'll try to link all of these in the, in the, the description underneath the video, but that'll take me a day or two to get to. Um, the Bible and the Closet by Watson and Lee. 
uh, that, I'll have a link to that. You can read online. Um, but if you can find a hardcover copy of it, get one. Uh, you won't be disappointed. Now, those are older books, right? We're talking 17th century, but they're not too hard to read. They're, they're not that difficult. The next one is a bit heavier of a read, and it's bigger. It's called Sacred Dissertations on the Lord's Prayer by Herman Witsius. I love this book. It was extremely helpful and encouraging for me, but it's a big one. And if you're not familiar with old writings with some archaic language, put that one off for a while. Um, the simplest one of these books to read is Praying the Bible by Don Whitney. Get that book. It's a little book, great introduction to how to pray more biblically, and it really will open up your prayer life in some great ways. The uh, A Praying Life by Paul Miller. Um, a very contemporary book, uh, very well written, and I don't remember most of what I read in that book, to be honest. I read the whole book and I enjoyed it. It, it did help me. But there were two key sections, just like in uh, The Bible in the Closet. There are two key sections in that book by Paul Miller that was transformative for me. So that's a good one to get, easy to read. And lastly, the one that I recommend the most is not a book on prayer, but a book of prayers. It's the Valley of Vision, a collection of Puritan prayers. And you can just read those as your prayer um, supplementally, right? It's not the only part of your prayer life, but it would be a good habit to pray through one of those written prayers on a daily basis to supplement the rest of your prayer life. And in my experience and in everyone, everyone's experience that I know who has used it, their prayer life has been greatly helped. Well, let's see. Do we have questions? Okay, we've got some questions. Let's see. Uh, all right. Where is the line between pleading with God and, for lack of a better word, sucking up to hopefully get what we want? Well, um, the heart is going to be the big difference, right? Uh, a person is uh, sucking up to another person to get what they want without any real affection or respect for that individual. So, um, and people can do that with God. We're not thinking about him. We're only thinking about ourselves, right? You do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, you ask with the wrong motives, right, from James. So if there isn't any regard for God's glory, that um, if there isn't any affection for the Lord, then yeah, you are a suck up and you need to stop that. But uh, so I don't know if it's a, a super fine line. It's, it's probably, probably, there's probably mixed motives at times in, in all of our prayer lives, but um, it is a pleading with God based on who he is, right? It's not buttering him up. It's a rejoicing in his character and in his work. Travis asks, Joe, will you give insight into the new book, Gentle and Lowly? Mm, okay. That is a book. You buy that book. That book is a great book. I'm only halfway through it. Uh, I'm going to call it most important book for me for the year, 2020. On. Um, and uh, Pastor Jimmy and I are actually going to be interviewing Dane Ortland, the author of that book, on an upcoming podcast, uh, so you can check that out there. Um, any other questions? I think we're pretty much wrapped up. Okay, guys, listen up. Sunday, we will be releasing our uh, sermon and song playlist and some of the scripture readings from our liturgy. So to stay connected to Redeemer Fellowship and what we normally do, come back to either uh, RedeemerFellowship.org or go to this YouTube channel if you're watching it there and um, go ahead and check it out. Share it with your friends. Discuss it amongst yourselves. Like I said, if you're not in a small group or in a, in a discipleship group, reach out to the church office and we will help you to plug in. Please know that we are praying for you and praying with you. Redeemer family, um, we love you and we miss you. Let me close this in prayer and you guys can enjoy the rest of your evening. Father in heaven, we are grateful for every good thing that you give us. Every good gift comes from you. Even the opportunity for us to, to share your word when we can't be face to face. So Lord, we're asking that you would knit our hearts together and that you would give us great order and strength to our faith as we seek to be with one, with one another in spirit and support one another from a distance. God, we pray that you would cause us to persevere through this time because Lord, it would show the world that we are not dependent on things as they always are to flourish, but we are only dependent on the means of grace, your word, prayer, the fellowship of the saints that we can have 
And so, Lord, until we can get back to life as normal, we trust that you will cause us to persevere, that you will provide for us, that you will heal us, that you will save the lost. God, we plead with you to hear us and to answer us, not because we are deserving, not because we pray well, but because you are good and generous. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night, Redeemer.